Welcome to Masterpieces at Midday. Um, this is a series we do as a way for our staff to kind of dive in deeper into our permanent collection. And I got a little sneak peek about what Mary Beth is going to share today, and I'm super duper thrilled. So I don't want to take up too much time. And I see a lot of familiar faces. So you all know the drill. Um, keep yourself on mute mute while Mary Beth is speaking just so she can get in her flow. You are more than welcome to add questions to the chat while we are discussing the works today. And then there will be there will be time at the end to ask your questions to Mary Beth. You can either turn your camera on and unmute yourself, which is you know the preferred mode. But if you would like to just add your questions to the chat, I can get them to Mary Beth as well. And a quick reminder, our next Masterpiece at Midday will be February 16th with me, and we'll be talking about Faith Ringgold. So Mary Beth, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, thank you all for being here today. Um, I just want to first say that this was the hardest presentation that I have put together because there is just so much I wanna talk about. And um, I also don't wanna overwhelm everyone. So this is just the very, 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 very surface of what the archives are at the Ceramics Research Center. Uh, today we'll talk about Spot. Um, my suggestion, not that we don't want to see your face, <laughs> my suggestion, <laughs> um, the internet speed. So what do you want me to do? I'm sorry, you cut out. I would suggest just turning your camera off because um, you came in and out a little bit. Okay. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, three things uh, that uh, are in the archive collection. It's not the only thing, but um, we're gonna talk about the Susan Peterson archive collection, which is also the name of our archive room, the Studio Potter archives, and then as well as library thing, which has to do with the book collection that we have. So to start, I would, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, Susan Peterson. Uh, Susan was a ceramicist as well as an educator whose research, writing, and advocacy brought wider appreciation to clay. She traveled and lectured worldwide and authored numerous books on ceramic techniques, glazes, and ceramic artists. She was awarded a lifetime achievement from the National Council of Education for the Ceramic Arts in 1999. She was an alumni of Mills College and the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. And she established several ceramic programs uh, throughout the um, United States. And she was an educator until 1994. So the um, image on the left is when she was at uh, Mills College and she was actually a painting major and painting majors were uh, required to take a ceramics class. And so she did that in her final semester. And she's here with Carlton Ball, who is um, an educator from Mills, was an educator from Mills College. And once she touched clay, that was the end of it. And she stopped painting and she was all about ceramics. Can everyone else still hear Mary Beth? Or did she just cut out for me? I can hear just fine, Kat. Okay. Okay, so the image on the right is uh, she was um, an instructor at USC Ceramics Department and this is a, a picture of her in the glazed room in 1955. And I'll just let you guys know that no one looks like that in the glazed room anymore. So this is a pretty, <laughs> pretty uh, unique um, image. And so this is her teaching at Hunter College, which uh, in 1994, and so that's the year that she actually retired. So um, 
from 1994 until 2009, she resided in um, uh, Carefree, Arizona, and then Scottsdale, Arizona. And she knew that the, the ASU Art Museum had a big ceramic collection as well as other crafts. And she wanted to donate the collection of books, slides, and notes and pottery to the museum so that it was available and accessible to researchers and students. The problem was um, at the time there was no uh, space. And so ASU and the museum worked to get a, a separate building. Um, if anyone is, is um, local and has been to the um, ASU yeah. museum, you'll notice that this is the building that's across the street. And this was our first building, which used to be a Schlotzky's Deli. So in 2002, um, we, we acquired um, her research archives of about 300 objects and 400 books, plus all of her archive materials from um, research, traveling, and um, manuscripts from books that she's um, authored. Um, so with that, in 2002, there was a grand opening, and uh, that was the beginning of the Ceramics Research Center and Archive Collection. Uh, Susan dedicated her career to researching, writing, and lecturing, and teaching about ceramics. So the archives do include much of her expansive personal collection of books, photographs, notes, and pottery. So um, this is just a little snapshot of um, her artist files. So she had, she had um, just boxes and boxes and boxes of domestic artists as well as international artists that are available and accessible for any sort of research. And on the right are two of her pieces that she donated that um, she created herself. So the other uh, thing that we received are manuscripts. So some of her classics are Shoji Hamada, The Living Tradition of Maria Martinez and um, Pottery by American Indian uh, women. So Soji was a Japanese potter and he was significant influence in studio pottery of the 20th century, a major figure in the Menge folk art movement and in establishing the town of Mashiko in Japan uh, as a world renowned pottery center. And Susan had um, a, a really close relationship with Shoji as she was writing a book about him and she did a lot of traveling to Japan. So these are some images that we have original photos of in our archive collection. Uh, the other one is Maria Martinez. Uh, she uh, was an, a Native American artist who created internationally known pottery. Uh, they, um, her family uh, examined traditional Pueblo pottery styles and techniques to create pieces which reflect the Pueblo people's legacy. And she was also known especially for her blackware pottery. So again, these are images that um, are in our collection that were used for the book. And to the right is um, an image of Maria doing a demo um, in Hunterton at a Hunterton um, hotel in California. So her, her um, craft and art of clay has uh, five editions now. And this is sort of the Bible for uh, potters and um, ceramic classes. And so, as you can see for the first edition to the right is the old school manuscript. So we have all of this in our collection. And then uh, this is probably my fav favorite image of Susan um, in 1968 and 69, she did a TV series called Wheels, Kilns and Clay. So we have all of the videos from this series um, in the archives. So in um, 2010, we received the first 30 volumes of Studio Potter uh, right here to the left. This is um, Jerry Williams, and he was the founder of the Studio Potter, the founding director and first editor of Studio Potter, and his wife, Julie, was the founding business manager. Together they traveled, interviewed, wrote and lectured about issues concerning potters throughout the United States. He had a vision um, that was the forefront of offering insightful writings of technology, criticism, aesthetics, 
and history within the ceramics community. So when Studio Potter was first published, it, um, the issue in 1972, it took the distinctive potter's mark as a symbol, the fingerprint-like mark made when a pot is cut off the potter's wheel. It's a universal emblem recognizable to potters everywhere. For founders Jerry and Julie Williams, this simple symbol represented an icon approach to pottery and publishing. At the time, two magazines were um, preeminent in the field, Ceramics Monthly and Craft Horizons, now known as American Craft. The publication, but those publications covered schools and galleries, but not working potteries, and that a new journal in the ceramics art, arts written by for potters could fill that void. So we were lucky enough to get um, the archive. So this is all the banker boxes. Um, you can't tell, but there's probably over 60 banker boxes. And then to the right is um, probably over 700 cassettes of when Jerry Williams would go traveling and then he would record all of the interviews that he did with ceramic artists. So I was fortunate enough to have a um, small volunteer group of retired um, individuals from uh, libraries and um, education. And this is us going through every single piece of paper from every single box and um, doing an inventory and putting together a finder's aid for the use of uh, Studio Potter. Uh, we did this with uh, Susan Peterson as well. Uh, this again is in the, the old CRC and um, just remember what this looks like. This is where the Studio Potter um, was eventually housed. And this is just a little example of um, what the beginning of the finder's aid looked like. And so basically these finder's aids came out to be over a hundred pages because every single file within every single box was inventoried so that people can look to see what it is that they want and they can request like which box it came from and which file. So then in 2014, uh, the Ceramics Research Center moved to um, Mill Avenue, uh, 7th and Mill, so like maybe three blocks away from where we were before. And this was an old border house, uh, Borders uh, Cafe, so we can't get out of the food industry, I guess. So if you remember what the, the old archives room looked like, this was definitely um, exciting that we had all this space. And um, this, it doesn't even look like this anymore. Uh, the table's no longer there and we have file cabinets that are back to back in the center, file cabinets to the left. And we have, um, we have uh, all the books in its own uh, room for the library. Our library collection houses over 3,000 titles of rare exhibition catalogs, books, periodicals, and media. The collection of uh, books are personal library collections of Susan Peterson, Ralph Becerra, who is another um, well-known ceramic artist, Harry Dennis, and James and Nan McKinnell. So Kat, I don't know if you want to throw in the chat the link to get to library thing, which is what we use as a database for the collection so people can uh, search for uh, titles, uh, whether it's books, periodicals, um, and uh, um, audio and um, video. So in uh, 2019, we received two more archives which are in the process of being um, uh, cataloged. Uh, so I'll just briefly talk about um, Don Wright's. Um, he was one of the most um, amazing throwers in the field. Uh, he was a leader of the workshop circuit, an educator, and um, he was just a very uh, warm and kind man. He was named as one of the top 12 wor world's greatest living potters from Ceramic Monthly. He received his MS MFA at Alfred University and experimented a lot with the salt uh, glazing technique. Um, so uh, he lived and worked in Clarkdale, Arizona, and 
He claimed that he would be a, a poet, but his dyslexia and his inability to process language um, was challenging. So he re redirected to um, visual arts and that's where he found his voice in clay. So um, the uh, Wrights Ranch, which is in Clarksdale is still um, up and running and his legacy is still um, alive. And so to the left is a photo from our archives and then to the right is one of, our, one of his pieces from our collection. Uh, the other archive that we received recently that's in the process as well is Herbert Sanders. Uh, he is best known for the crystalline glazes and lusters that he uses on his ceramic vessels. And um, we received not only um, mat uh, archive material, but also objects that um, researchers and students can um, refer to uh, for further research. Uh, and we do have all of his glaze calculation uh, books in our archives. So I thought I would try something a little bit fun since we're talking about archives. Um, and uh, what I ended up doing with, is I pulled some examples uh, just to show you that even though we have separate collections of archives, they all work together and um, even our permanent collection, uh, it, it just all comes together to make a very rich uh, content for researching or exhibitions or for students studying. So to the left is an image from the archives and then the right is um, one of our pieces in our permanent collection. And uh, the one thing from Studio Potter is uh, we received um, over 700 cassettes of audio interviews that Jerry did. And during um, uh, maybe 2015, 2016, we had a volunteer come in and digitize all of them. So these are available as MP3s. So I'm just gonna play a little bit so you can um, hear her voice. Um, she was a very eccentric woman. Uh, so I'm just gonna play a little bit of the interview for you here. Um, would you just uh, give me your name and uh, where you were born for the tape? Beatrice Wood, born in San Francisco in 1893. And though I'm in my 100th year, my official year, is th my official age is 32. And why is your official age 32? Because uh, mentally, I've decided to stay at that age full of interest in the world. So Beatrice was quite a character. Um, here's another picture of Susan Peterson uh, and Beatrice Wood visiting in the 1970s. The other thing that I pulled from correspondence was a letter that uh, Beatrice wrote to Susan while Susan was in India. And I'll just pull a few, few lines here. Uh, she said that she loved India so much that she felt Indian instead of American. When I visited there, of course, I fell in love with two Indians that helped, and that helped. But then I was always falling in love if a man looks at me twice. And then down below, she had mentioned, uh, you must have been, you must be having rich experiences. Since you asked if you can bring me back something from India, I suggest a nice young man of 25 with black hair who knows enough to say, I love you. That will make up for all the hours I am losing in my workroom. So this letter was done in 1997. And when Beatrice wrote this letter, she was 104. So she never lost her spunk. <laughs> um, another another um, example that I pulled was uh, from Rudy Audio. And so this was an image from uh, drawing on clay uh, from Studio Potter. To the right is um, one of our pieces in our permanent collection. And again, from Studio Potter, we have um, an audio interview. And uh, Rudy Audio was, um, he lived in Montana and he was one of the founding residents at the Archie Bray uh, Ceramics Foundation in Helena. And uh, he's known for his torso shaped vessels that are painted with figures and animals in a free linear, linear style reminiscent of um, Matisse. So the beginning of this interview, he's just talking a little bit about Montana and uh, the Archie Bray uh, residents. Oops. 
October day. <laughs> um, but you didn't start uh, just out of the cold working with, with Clay with, with Francis. How did you build No, it? I was an art student. I was interested in many things. I think my central interest in those years was sculpture. But uh, it was a small art school staffed by some very good teachers at that time and a very good group of uh, students, Pete Volkerson including, uh, and uh, my wife, who was a very fine art person, art student. What, do, what does she do? Oh, she is a painter, primarily. Okay, so I also found a letter to Susan, and I find this to be um, a, a pretty important um, pivot. Uh, when Susan started in the 1950s, uh, ceramics was definitely a, a male dominant um, area of study. And uh, a lot of the women really had to step up and um, really prove themselves in, in this um, environment. And, you know, Susan also had uh, a lot of rude comments about um, being a mother and being an artist and how you can't be both. So Rudio was uh, one of the artists in the 1950s that um, was really dominating that, that um, male energy. So this was from 2001 and he said, uh, your life in ceramics is a big contribution as anybody's. You made a lot, of, you made a lot happen, you knew the Titans and you've left a legacy of books and good stuff that will paint the pages of our time. Congratulations, I think it's time somebody wrote a good book about you. And then he also says about her uh, son, Tog, that um, he's some kind of kid, he's got some kind of mom. So I just thought that, that was um, a, a nice confirmation of, of the, the amount of work that she put in, the strong woman that she was, that she was able to get past all of that and uh, really become a successful uh, female artist and uh, educator. Okay, so the other way that we use our archives is when we have people visiting um, to do research, whether it's for exhibitions, for publications. Um, Jenny Sorkin is definitely no stranger to the Ceramics Research Center archives. Uh, she's been to uh, the, the CRC uh, for writing articles and um, the last visit was for her publication, Women's Ceramics and Community, uh, the live form. And one of the chapters in there is called Women Kitchen Potters, Susan Peterson, the Julia Child of Ceramics. So she had mentioned that without using the archives at the Ceramics Research Center that this chapter would not have been completed. And she's also an advocate for her graduate students as well. Uh, we've had uh, many of her grad students come to do research, not only in the archives, but also in our, our uh, permanent collection. So as far as incorporating the archives in our exhibitions, the first one uh, was from 2012 at the old CRC and it was our 10th anniversary. And um, so we had just received um, the Studio Potter uh, archives two years ago, and we wanted to make a tribute wall as one of the things that um, we've acquired in the last 10 years. So myself and volunteers pulled a bunch of portraits from the archives and had a long wall uh, in tribute to the Studio, Tour, or Studio Potter as well as um, uh, Studio Potter's. This is an exhibition that I curated and it was Clay Blazers, which um, was a tribute to uh, women artists of the 50s, 60s and 70s. So this was all permanent collection. There was about a hundred objects and focusing on 40 women artists that we had in our collection. So I incorporated a lot of archives in this um, exhibition. You can see um, on the top, this was uh, portraits, studio portraits of women artists that were in the show, which I gathered from both the Susan Peterson um, archive as well as Studio Potter. And then the videos that are on now were from her TV series. And then in the middle, I had uh, selected two women artists from the Studio Pottery um, audio interviews. 
Wonderland is another exhibition that I did. And this is between um, Patty Warshina and Michael Lucero. So again, pulling images of either letters or um, exhibition um, announcement cards uh, between Patty Warshina and Michael Lucero. And I also have to give credit to um, the Smithsonian because I also use their archives for some of the correspondence that you see here in front of you. And again, um, to the right, you'll see the headphones. And so we also had the Lucera and uh, Warashina audio interviews with Jerry Williams available for people to hear. I think it's important to have uh, visuals and um, audio um, and just correspondence or extra materials. I think it just gives you a different experience as to um, the, the, just the life and energy of the artist that's being um, on exhibition. Look to nature, nature is Toshiko Takeizu. And again, these are all objects that are pulled from our permanent collection. And so again, there's more images from the archives. And so we have original um, photos in the center exhibition um, announcements to the right, and then some photos of when I took a trip to Toshiko's studio uh, prior COVID. So the other thing that um, is really important for the future of our archives is um, the preservation and uh, conservation of, of the archives. So it's uh, fortunate that we have Dana Tepper, who is our chief um, conservator, who uh, helps with um, conditioning the archives when I pull them. So this is from Studio Potter. These are contact sheets. And um, I found um, a silent film, a two minute silent film from Susan Peterson's archives that I digitized to show um, her process of glazing. And I like these contact sheets because it is um, just a series of her glazing as well. And you can see to the left that there's some damage. And so uh, Dana is able to uh, re restore as much as she can. And then we also use it as a teaching tool. You'll see that there's um, an extended label and it talks about conservation and how conservation helped with um, the exhibition. So this is the digitized video that I was talking about. And so I'm gonna play that for you now. It's two minutes and it's silent. It looks like we, Mary Beth had a little technical difficulty because she's disappeared. So let's just give her a second to rejoin. Um, and then if not, I do have a video for her that she's planning on playing that we could play um, sooner while she reconnects. Andrea, why don't we go ahead and play that video? She said her laptop shut down. <laughs> and so okay. she's gonna reboot. I will play it right now.
Thanks, Bobby. Apparently there's no sound, Andrea. I'm not sure if the video has sound because I'm not hearing anything either. Susan Peterson, Soji Hamada, A Potter's Way and Work, Tokyo, New York, 1974, pages 202 to 204. Now in the early morning, we are leaving this village. Mashiko in its special way has influenced Hamada's life and work as he has influenced it. And both in their own way have seemed to remain independent of Japan's phenomenal movement from a traditional to a modern urban society. Mashiko, the town with one two mile long street winding up from the railroad station past Hamada's house, where women chat and work with babies strapped to their backs, where the small stores with wooden shoji fronts follow one upon the other, block after block, close together, with occasionally an alley between, Bright yellow and pink plastic utensils cover the fronts of the grocery shops, the lotion shops, the flower shops. Here is the bonsai man with racks of small potted trees and the shop of the flower lady who once a week was hired by the inn to change the arrangement in my room and the peanut man drying his crop and the hardworking couple in the rice polishing and sales shop. An endless number of pottery parlors with wares for sale from the 105 kilns are all along the streets and its tributaries, full of amazing variety of shapes. The stores, absolutely next to each other, seem to number 100 along the narrow street. All the fronts are open during the day and closed at night with sliding doors of wood and small panes of glass when the family moves inside. There are so many vegetable and fruit stands that it is impossible to believe people can eat or buy so much. Boys and girls walk to school in blue uniforms and carry airline flight bags full of books. Men and women ride bicycles piled with merchandise or carry loads of wood or other bundles on their backs or heads. Mashiko is a town now with a population of 20,000. Traffic on the narrow two-lane main street is congested with cars, buses, trucks, bicycles, carts, pedestrians, all wanting a place. Noise is a terrible factor, the horns of all vehicles being the most used noisemaker when passing. Rice husking machines sputter in the fields and there are hammers of new construction, the thrum of heavy tires against pavement, and the clack of all sorts of things carried by hand or on poles over the shoulder. Still, it is possible to be unaware of these constant sounds as soon as one climbs a path toward the hillside away from the main street or goes beyond the confined area of town in any direction. Many times from these same hills, I have looked down into the valley across the blackened rice fields piled with the harvest to the roofs of blue and black tile standing out among the thatch of the old style farm dwellings. The people of the potteries often visit the shrines after the hard work of firing a kiln. Always black smoke from the kilns rises straight up in the sky, dense and thin at the narrow base of the inverted cone as it comes from the flue, broadening and dissipating as it rises slowly high into the air, gradually becoming nothing. On a clear day when there is no wind, when the sky is blue and there are no clouds, then the cone of smoke stays in the air a long time, eventually spreading out horizontally with gray wisps suspended over the spot where it is born. Smoke from the kilns is a trademark of this village. Hamada 20.12-13, Correspondence SHP, first paragraph. Letter to Hamada, January 31st, 1963. I have been receiving the letters back which I sent to you from various parts of the world after visiting you last January about this time in Japan. I returned to this country and have resumed my teaching at the University of Southern California.
but I am absolutely dismayed that none of my letters to you have reached you. Thanking you for the most marvelous of all experiences, that day with you in Mexico, and later telling you of the meetings with Tanamora and Takeuchi, and of the O'Hara Gallery experience, and even later of the meeting with Leach at St. Ives. Hamada, 20.12-8 and 20.12-9, Correspondence SHP. Monday, January 22nd, Imperial Hotel, Tokyo. We got to Mexico and wandered through the village all afternoon, filled with potteries, hills, kilns, quiet, cold. It's very interesting. In a taxi late afternoon over rough, rugged roads through flat farming country, strawberries grown under plastic, and rice to Utsunomiya, a wonderful small city. We're bounded out. It's now all new, filled with Saturday night peasants and huge neon signs. We stayed at a Japanese inn with no heat, but with hibachi, kimonos, and good food. We bought pots and had a heck of a time getting it shipped. Finally, an inn boy built wooden boxes. We hope they get through. The next day, we traveled by taxi back to Mishiko to Hamada's farm, a beautiful place. He took us into the fireplace you brought, there's a picture of him sitting beside his son. We had morning tea with the pottery workers. He took us around the three kilns, work areas, and to his gorgeous house, an old Japanese farmhouse with 24-inch heavy wooden beams all over, with room after huge room of beautiful collections of pots from all ages and all cultures. He gave me one pot and I bought two, one to bring back to Kuni. They gave us lunch in Japanese style on the floor cooked at a table with about seven kinds of fish, tempura style, and all sorts of meat, squid charcoal broiled, various bean curd cheeses, and spiced cold things. Well, it was a remarkable experience. He and his sons were so kind and gracious to us. Visitors coming and going all day, but none of them inside, and treated as we were. Even people from the Canadian Embassy were only spoken with outside. So we left at 4 o'clock on the funny train and headed back to Tokyo by train. All right, Mary Beth, are you back with us? I see you. Can you all hear? Because, you know, I couldn't hear earlier. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll speak a little bit about um, Mary Beth gave me the lowdown on the video we just watched, and hopefully she can get connected to the audio. But that comes from um, an exhibition we did called Road, Rogue Objects. Um, and so we had two visual artists, Japanese based, Koki Tanaka and Kumi Tsuda, and they came in and they're the first visual artists to work with the ASU um, Ceramics Research Center archive. And so they were influenced by, you, we saw those correspondence between um, Peterson, Susan Peterson, and a Japanese ceramic artist named Soji Hamada. And so that film just takes us through kind of their, their relationship. Um, and we hear our very own Mary Beth narrating it. And so the, the exhibition that was paired with that, um, Koki and Kumi looked at pieces from our permanent collection and kind of mapped things that weren't always on display or didn't have um, extended research on them. And they wanted to kind of highlight the things that we don't always show in our permanent or from our permanent collection. And then they use the archive to kind of create this narrative and, and conduct this research. And I see she says she's back. I'm admitting her again. So fingers crossed everyone, she's with us.
Mary Beth. Okay, well, to be aware of people's time, let's transition to questions. So if anyone has specific questions, Mary Beth, if you can at least um, use the chat function <laughs> or you can call me on my cell and I can, you know, share what you're saying that way. So do we have any questions about this idea of a, of a museum archive and, and what it's used for, kind of how it was created and why it's still so relevant today? All right, Mary Beth, we have a question and it says, what is your favorite item in the archive as of today? <clears throat> Hi, we're now on the phone, everybody, with Mary Beth. I feel like a news reporter. <laughs> Hi. Yes, I, I shared that. So, <laughs> so Andrea's question, what is your favorite item in the archive as of today? I'm putting you on speaker, Mary Beth, just so you know. Can you guys hear her? Okay. Let me know. So, I mean, I think one of the gems is definitely, um, you know, looking at Jerry Williams, his uh, journals as he was traveling and um, the audio interviews, because you just get a different sense. You know, you have, you have the audio, you have the visuals, you have all of that. So I think that's definitely um, a bonus when um, putting all of the, the research together. But honestly, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you what my favorite thing is. Great, thank you. Yeah. Bobby asks, are there any future plans to digitize all the paper in the archives? Oh, yes, there's always, uh, well, it's, 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 yeah. So what we've been doing is as I've been pulling things for exhibitions or as people are requesting things, we're digitizing that way, which is obviously not the most, um, efficient way of doing it but it's the only way we can do it now as far as you know cost and time um before the pandemic i was talking to um the director at the um, design library as well as a former librarian from the phoenix art museum and you know we're gathering information so that we can you know write grants and actually get uh get this digitized i mean it, it's a dream of mine to have that done uh so obviously the answer would be we need funding and then we would definitely need more staff and we would need equipment. But yes, that would be amazing if we could actually get that all uh, digitized. Great. And then Mary Beth, um, if anyone else has questions, please put them in the chat. But I wanted to ask about the trip you took um, that you kind of were talking about earlier. The trip when I was at Tashikos? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was pre-pandemic. It was in December of 2019, and um, my family's all from back east, so it was easy for me to travel um, on my own time to Toshiko's studio. Uh, so one of her apprentices is now um, the owner of her estate, and he keeps it running the way Toshiko was running it. Uh, the house is the same. There's the garden. There's the, the backyard area with all the bells that she's done in bronze. Um, as well as studio space for artists and so i was able to spend two days there and just go through boxes and boxes of archives um reading correspondence and um pulling images for that the, the wall that you saw um for the tashiko show and it was just amazing i was surrounded by all of her work 
outside of a museum setting, which is definitely a lot different of an experience because they're right next to you or you're touching them, which is not allowed at the museum. Definitely. So it was, yeah, so it was an, it was an amazing trip. Um, she ended her career doing bronze bells, so I went uh, not only to her studio, but to uh, campuses that had her bells and um, did some recordings of the different bells, which one was incorporated into the space um, for the exhibition that rings every 10 minutes. Amazing. And then another question we got is how many people are on um, your staff? So I'm not sure if that means the whole museum or um, specifically for the Ceramics Research Center, but maybe you can talk about how many um, staff we have designated at the Ceramics Research Center. So uh, that would be me. And then when we're open to the public uh, security and uh, pre-pandemic, uh, we have a um, very dedicated uh, volunteer that has been working 10 plus years, uh, Sid Cohen. I think he might be on this call. Um, and so I basically, to run the CRC and to do projects, I rely heavily on volunteers as well as um, uh, academic interns that um, are either grad or undergrad ceramic students. Um, I've had someone working on their master's of library science um, degree. Uh, so that's that's where I incorporate all of the manpower for the archives and any other um, projects that we're doing, like the library, we keep getting books in. So that's someone that has to input all that data. So that's basically my staff. So right now in pandemic, there aren't any volunteers or interns right now. So um, that changes the projects and the priorities. Definitely, very cool. And I guess I'll share one last final question. And what do you think the the strength is in using an archive to exhibit versus, you know, like a traveling show coming into your institutional space? Um, well, I think that, um, you know, if you have a permanent collection, you should be showing your permanent collection. Why would you be collecting if you're not going to show things, right? And there are a lot of things like the Tashiko show. We have 37 objects from Tashiko, which half of them have been in storage. And so this show uh, is the first time half of those objects has been, you know, has been out. So I think it's important to use your um, permanent collection. And I, I just um, with with the Open Storage Grounds Research Center, that's always there for people to see. And then when you're pulling in archive materials, it's definitely an experience that you're not going to get. You, you know that the objects out. You're you're going kind of the life of the artist, and with um, correspondence or um, audio or video. So I think it's just a powerful way to to add into the exhibition itself. And that doesn't mean that, you know, if you're doing permanent or archive that you couldn't travel, but, um, you know, I think it's important to really focus on what a museum actually has in their collection. I agree, that was beautifully said. And you've definitely dem Thanks. demonstrated through your exhibitions that you're good at creating a robust narrative and really highlighting what we have to offer and not to like, you know, put us on a pedestal guys, but we're a real gem. So if you haven't visited us yet, we are yeah. doing timed entry at the CRC as well, right? And we're open yeah. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 11 to five. So yeah. come check and, us out. Yes, and the, if I can quickly say mm -hmm. um, that we are a gem and the archives are a gem within a gem. So <laughs> if you ever want to come and visit, uh, if we can, uh, I can do a one-on-one -on -one private appointment if anyone wants to do research um, or just like look at things in person and also I just want to say I think I briefly saw before technical difficulties that Mary Berenger is on the call um, she was a big um, part of getting the studio pottery um, potter archive to the ASU so I just wanted to say hello to her she's waving I don't know if okay, you can good. see us. I'm waiting to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. This 
is really um, a big passion of mine. So I would um, love any kind of uh, email or correspondence if you want to know more. This is really just like the surface. Right. Well, with that, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Mary Beth. It's always a treat to, to hear your expertise. Um, I appreciate everyone sticking with us through our technical difficulties. Sarah confirmed Mercury is in retrograde, everyone. So be prepared for this. <laughs> um, we will see you February 16th. I will be talking about Faith Ringgold. And as always, thank you for learning about art and loving art with us. See you guys then. Thank you. Bye.